Thank you very much. Uh, I'm David Skvetch, I'm the Head of Supercomputing at Pawsey. Um, usual disclaimer applies. Uh, the opinions that I may or may not express are my own. They do not reflect my boss, Neil Stringfellow, nor the Pawsey board. So um, if you're a journalist, please don't misquote me. I've been misquoted before. Uh, has landed me in a little bit of hot water occasionally. Um, this is going to be a bit of a rambly talk. Uh, much like Alan, I wasn't given really much time in terms of preparation, so I've put a few ideas together and hopefully they will stick. Uh, Pawsey Sibling Centre, unfortunately because JC got in before me, uh, he got to show the picture first. Um, for those who are interested, uh, as has been mentioned, there is going to be a, a tour this evening, so you can see a, a very fancy building, the machine within it. Um, just to give you a bit of background, uh, originally we were called IVEC. So we started in about 2001, we we're mostly state and uh, funded and partner funded and we we're here to provide uh, HPC resources to uh, WA researchers. That changed in about 2009 as part of the Super Science Initiative. The federal government gave Harvick $80 million to set up the Pawsey Centre. Um, so as not to confuse people because people didn't know what the difference between IVEC and the Pawsey Centre was, we rebranded re in 2014. So the Pawsey Supermoon Centre runs the Pawsey Centre, which contains Pawsey infrastructure. Um, our pride and joy is Magnus. Magnus, until very recently, was the most powerful supermoon in the Southern Hemisphere. We're now the second most powerful supermoon in the Southern Hemisphere. We've been pipped by our colleagues uh, over NCI. Unfortunately, I was in Germany when it happened. Um, so I had to wear that shame, um, but we're all trying to do the same thing. We have a Cray XC40, it's made up of 1,488 compute nodes, 35,712 compute cores, and it's capable of about 1.1 petaflops. Um, the analogy that I was still, uh, I think it's Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, he gave everyone on the, hand, uh, on the planet a hand calculator. It would taken 10 years to do what Magnus does in a second. Galaxy, so again, JC has stolen my thunder, but it's okay, he normally does that. Um, slightly smaller Cray XC30. What uh, JC didn't mention is there are actually also 64 GPU nodes in Galaxy, but he doesn't care about them because they're for MWA. Um, this is part of Pawsey's commitment to support both precursor projects to the Square Kilometre Array. Uh, the compute uh, is about 25% of our, the total compute capacity at Pawsey. The storage that we provide to the radio astronomies is a little more than 25%, but we'll get to that uh, a little later on. Nimbus is our cloud infrastructure, because cloud is cool. Um, again, this is alluding to um, something that uh, Alan Williams from NCI mentioned. The important thing is, is having the cloud close to the data. You know, part of the reason you know, people are asking well, why do this, if you just want simple cloud computing, you go to AWS. You know, it's just, you know, they do it at scale, it's more cost effective, you know, why play in this space? The reason is, is potentially we can offer services that they can't by having compute close to data. Okay, and we can offer services that um, they can't provide. We have lots of storage. So again, if you go on the tool, you'll be able to see these two uh, tape libraries. We currently have about 50 petabytes of uh, raw tape. And most of that is currently being taken up by the radio astronomers because they, and excuse the pun, produce an astronomical amount of data. Um, normally it gets a laugh, which is why I keep on doing it, but anyway. Um, because at the end, at end of the day, you, want, you need to be able to store um, researchers' data. Which then gets us to Athena. So Athena is our advanced technology cluster. Um, all supercomputers have a life cycle. Um, Moore's law basically said that every 18 months, compute power doubles, which means in three years' time, you can get a supercomputer that's basically four times as powerful as the one before. And the big problem with all supercomputers up here is the running costs, operational costs in terms of power and cooling. Right? It's basically simple um, economics that comes down to it. Um, so uh, Magnus's predecessor was a machine called Epic. Uh, Epic was 9,600 cores, is about 87 teraflops in, in real power and consumed 400 kilowatts uh, of electrical power. Magnus is 10 times more powerful and only consumes 50% more power. My economics basically dictated that EPIC was decommissioned and we looked after Magnus. The running costs were just too high. Um, I believe that the, the, uh, the price tag for running EPIC, just the electricity, was about $400,000 a year, just in, in electrical cost. So Magnus is at some stage um, going to be replaced. Um, 
its warranty runs out in September. The plans basically extend that out for 12 months. But we need to look to the future. And you know, the two hot technologies that when we went out to researchers and asked them what they were interested in, it was um, basically the Xeon Fire, the Knight's Landing version, and the NVIDIA Pascal GPU. All right, and so we have a, a rack of 11 nodes with four GPUs in them, and then two racks of uh, Knight's Landing Intel Xeon Fly. And the hope is, is that these will inform what Magnus's replacement will look like. Because at the end of the day, we're here to support Australian science. Okay, uh, Pawsey has about 150 projects currently running on their supercomputers. We're about 1,200 different researchers. Uh, and I checked last week, we have something in the order of about 200 different scientific codes that run on these machines. Okay, and if Australian researchers can't take advantage of the technology that we provide them, then those technologies are no good for them. Okay, because we have such a wide range of use cases. Um, we're looking at uh, people across a, a, a wide field of science domains. Um, we have to try and support them all. And I think the days of having a homogeneous system are over. Uh, and what you'll probably find is something that um, NCI has is, is it's going to become a more heterogeneous system. Right? You're going to have things where you're going to have GPUs are part of that mix. You're going to have things where um, uh, traditional cores are, are part of that mix. But you're also going to look at things where the infrastructure is far more dynamic. You know, and people talk about having being able to have bare metal and being able to provision as cloud or as HPC. And that's, that's where I think a lot of where this is going. Uh, pictures are cool. Again, just to mention that we support um, the radio astronomers. JC again mentioned this. So, Bellardi stations where MWA and ASCAP have their telescopes. There are five 10 gigabit links that go from uh, Merchants Radio Observatory directly into Pawsey. Um, four of them are dedicated to ASCAP, one of them dedicated to MWA. It's all fibre, happened as part of the National Broadband Network. And the nice thing about this is, despite what the government will tell you, is you can upgrade it. Right, you can at either end of that fibre upgrade those links and you can go from 10 gigabit to 100 gigabit, which is why laying uh, fibre is important. Uh, ASCAP have the 36 telescopes, uh, which JC promised me will go operational any day soon. MWA, and I suspect uh, Andreas is going to touch on a bit of this, have 2048 dipoles, a ton of spider things um, it's spread all over the M uh, MRO. So just to touch briefly, um, there are three layers to HPC. Right? There's the hardware, there's the software, and there's the people. Right? The software is important and um, as I said before, we have a wide range of codes that we need to support. Uh, and trying to uh, evaluate them and benchmark them is a time consuming process. So we actually spent uh, quite, uh, a little bit of time uh, writing our own software installation program called Mali open source, you can go to GitHub and find it, and this has uh, allowed us to rebuild our software stacks in different platforms. Right? So we've been able to move from a CentOS 6 platform that was running on Epic to a CentOS 6 platform that was running on Fornax, which was a GPU machine. We've taken that same platform, moved it to the Cray Linux environment and to the Celez environment. Right? And the, soft the software that we wrote to look after has been important because it's reduced the amount of effort we need to support researchers. It's the same software we use to install software, we can get researchers to look after our own software. Right? At the end of the day, it's the people that are the most important part of any HPC centre. Okay? Having a, someone give you a bucket of money to buy a bunch of hardware to box drop in a white space is easy. Looking after it is hard. Right? And part of the reason why we develop Mali is to reduce the amount of effort these people have to do in terms of software support. The number of people come up and said, can you please uh, install um, random piece of software X, Y, and Z. Um, part of the issue we have, however, is HPC is a very, very small industry. Right? It's, it's, you look at the big centres uh, in, in Europe, or in the US, uh, and then Asia is the big uh, growing area. But in, in Australia, uh, in, in some respects, um, HPC has shrunk a little bit. Um, for, for better and worse, the National uh, Research Infrastructure, Infrastructure Road Mapping Exercise identified two peak facilities, us and NCI. You know, there used to be, uh, back in the days of APAC, uh, a HPC site in every state. You know, and they have slowly, for, for, for whatever reason, disappeared. And so when we're looking for, um, to recruit people, we have to go overseas in most cases which is a sad state of affairs. So recently I went out to recruit two more supercomputing application specialists 
of the eight people that were interviewed, one was local. All of the seven others were overseas. And so we're starting to try and grow a lot of the local talent as much as possible. So we recently hired two HPC support officers, both very green. Um, they have good Linux skills, they've got big, big good problem solving skills, but know nothing about HPC. Right? But eight years ago, I knew nothing about HPC. You know, someone gave me uh, half a million dollars, uh, helped by my first supercomputer. I didn't know what InfiniBand was kept on plugging cables in, didn't know why it worked. Apparently there's something called a subnet manager that you have to turn on. Yeah. All right? Everything that I learned about HPC has been through trial and error. All right? And that's what we're trying to do at Pause, is trying to grow some of that local talent. Um, so training and outreach is extremely important, especially for Australian researchers. There has been a, a exponential growth in the amount of compute power available to Australian researchers in the last three to four years. Um, Pawsey's gone from a four teraflop to a hundred teraflop to a petaflop machine in the space of about four years. Uh, NCI's probably uh, had a, a similar growth and, and ensuring that researchers are able to take advantage of, of what they have available is extremely important. So Pawsey runs local training at least four times a year. We've recently gone national and hoping to do that four times a year. Um, but we also have um, uh, clinic dropping clinics, we're looking also at online training, right? trying to get the, the, the information out to researchers so they can take advantage of this infrastructure is extremely important. Which gets to the interns, so pausey has been running the intern uh, program for I believe about um, 10 years, I think the last time I looked at the annual report we've had 132 students go through the intern program. Uh, and this is basically training the next generation of computational scientists. Uh, so last uh, uh, summer break, I think there were 16 students. Um, they were basically given, uh, I think it's $10,000, $6,000? Yeah, $6,000, yeah. Um, to work over 10 weeks over their summer break. Right? They got to work on a project with one of the researchers who already have access to palsy, and they get to a bit of a taste of uh, what it is to, um, to uh, be involved in HPC. And a lot of these go on to be the next generation of computational scientists. And we have examples of uh, at least a dozen of uh, people who went through the Paul's intern um, program who are now researchers in their own right. Uh, and this is all about um, trying to grow local talent. And I think that's the end of my spell. So anyone have any questions? So part of it is engaging with uh, some of the vendors and some of it's also looking at things um, uh, like something that David Abraham was talking about in terms of debugging. So one of the things that we have access to is a linear, uh, so Forge and DDT. So we're trying to organise with them to have some uh, on, on site training at Pawsey, trying to get the researchers involved so they can take advantage of some of the tools that we have available. Uh, some of it is uh, teaching my staff so they can teach researchers. So recently we had people from Intel to run us through things like uh, all the ins and outs of the Intel Xeon 5 processor, what compiler options are required and all the rest of it. And so we can take that information, retool our own training to make sure that that information gets put across. So as part of what we're doing with Athena is that we're going to be trained specific about the Intel Xeon Fire and specific about the NVIDIA GPU and so that we can really target that so people can take advantage of those technologies rather than just here is a machine, good luck. Uh, JC, I don't think I want to answer your question. <laughs> I don't know when you're going to get a replacement machine. <laughs> No, it's not a question, uh, Dave. Uh, yes. So just uh, sorry that I spoil you. It's fine. <laughs> I realise that. Uh, but the, I just want to clarif clarify that the picture that you show with the cable, just to let you know that actually the, the fibre that goes from the MRO to the, is not going to that actual cable. <laughs> just, just in case. <laughs> no, no, no. People I've, that it's actually buried. I've, yeah. I've been told that bush is very important. Yeah, no, that's all right. So that's the that's, correlator. You yeah, told me no, that was a correlator, no? no. <laughs> so that actually, in fact, that probably uh, cable is gone. 
Oh, yeah, but it's a lovely picture. That's, uh, a lovely yeah, picture. That's, <laughs> that's not even fiber. I think that's just some copper cable. That someone yeah, just it, is copper, it the, was yeah. copper cable, I believe. That it was through the bush. It, it was, yeah, it, it had to lay temporarily just to get data from a weather station that it was up I'm there. I'm happy to make a bet with you that that's still there. <laughs> no, I don't think it's there anymore. But I was there in March and I didn't see it. That, that, that exact bush. Oh, no, I don't know the bush. Yeah.